I can't imagine anything more boring than having to read about writers, unless it would be having to read about drinking. So, naturally, boom, I find myself holding a book entitled On Writers and Drinking. A magical combination. Not really. It's about six drunken male American writers, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, Tennessee Williams, John Cheever, John Berryman, and Raymond Carver. It's written by a British lady who has become something of a hot commodity, if a writer can be said to attain that level today. Given the subject matter, this isn't a pleasant book. She tacks on an upbeat ending, but it's still a devastating read. It's about misery, suffering, depression, insomnia, sadness, fear, anxiety, betrayal, and sometimes all of these together, with a dash of homosexuality and all of it soaking in alcohol. The book is also about travel, as the author goes from New York City to New Orleans to Key West to the state of Washington, covering the ground and visiting the exact sites where these people tried to drown their sorrows, or at least drink themselves silly. For her, this is a pilgrimage. It's intensely personal, as well as thoroughly researched. What drew me into the book was the feeling I got of the author's almost desperate need to write it. She is both calm and very driven, clinically detached, and intimately connected. One moment she is referencing the scientific analysis of alcoholism as a disease, and in the next, she is beginning to cry. So this becomes a well-written travel book, which keeps it from being morbid or maudlin, which can be tricky when the subjects of your book are all deeply depressed individuals, mired in self-loathing, two of whom wind up killing themselves. When you're at a stage where you're looking at drink as a solution to your mounting woes, instead of being a problem, you're already past the recovery zone. I have spoken in a few of these about being lost, and the people she considers in this book were all, at one time or another, profoundly lost. I've also said a few things about nurture, and these are lives that ring all sorts of alarms about the results of badly ruptured nurture. She cites something called the Adverse Childhood Experience, ACE, study, but common sense tells me that if you encounter horrific experiences as a child, the adult you are going to be completely and permanently affected by that. It's going to be completely and permanently affected by that. The author does like to write to capture her word, world in words. She can go off. Here's a typical passage about the approach to New Orleans by train. By the time we reached the shore, the sky was putting on a real show. The clouds were mauve on their upper parts and a mottled orange underneath. There was a violet cast to the shadows, and the palms were printed very sharply against the rose-colored sky. An odd thing happened then. A single starling had appeared, and as it stuttered and weaved through the air, I saw a boy standing on the tracks holding a cardboard box in one arm and gesticulating with the other. His mouth was moving, but there wasn't a soul else in sight. Now what that has to do with anything, I don't know, but it pleased her to do it, and it sure beats thinking about drunks all the time. As for drinking and writing, at the risk of being very boring, I would say they are exact opposites. Drinking is an anesthetic, all about isolation, dullness, and the self. Writing is aesthetic, all about others, feeling, discovery, and awareness. It is, that is, when the writing is good. Writing is freedom, or at the very least, the urge to be free. Drinking, alcoholism, is a terrible trap. Hemingway wrote in a letter to a friend, the trouble was that all my life when things were really bad, I could always take a drink, and right away, they were very much better. Yikes. Contrast that to when the author overhears a guide in Key West, narrating the end of Hemingway's life for a group of tourists. He tells them that Hemingway had lost everything. He'd lost his memory, his manuscripts, his ability to work, to get around, his potency, all of his property in Cuba, everything. And then he shot himself 16 days before his 62nd birthday. The guide paused 
and the tourists burst into applause and showered him with money, stunning the author. A younger Hemingway, full of cynicism and self-confidence, would have had a good laugh at that, I think, and headed for the nearest cafe where the skillful bartender would fix Papa a fine, bracing mojito.